What happens when one man tries to watch all the horror films of the 1980s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project, 1981. Guys, we are getting very close to the ending of 1981 here, and, and we're headed into the tail end of the year now. And the, the, the next episode will close out the year. But before we do that, we have to finish up the rest of October and head into November. Notoriously a, a turkey time. But I think we're about to find out that this block is full of things that do not qualify. I know that we covered this year's big Halloween movie on the last episode, but we're still on that same date, October 30th. And it's the horror comedy, Saturday the 14th. And yeah, clearly the influence of Friday the 13th was so strong the parodies were already in full effect, even if this has nothing to do with summer camps or slashers. Instead, it has I'm not Oscar.com and his wife Yolanda, a couple of vampires interested in a house that has just been inherited by Richard Benjamin and Paula Prentice. And these two were a real life couple, defying that whole thing about Hollywood marriage since they were wed in 1961 and are still together today. They have two kids and move into the spooky mansion because even in the 80s, moving was the greatest terror, not long after they discover this mysterious book. When little Billy reads it, the creatures within materialize into the real world in all their cheap glory. Like, these are clearly just masks. And you can see the eye holes. And, and the monsters attack, but Billy soon discovers that the book will hurt them. It's a little behind on the timeliness of the satire since they do a Jaws joke, even if it does sort of act as a precursor to the Nightmare on Elm Street bath bit, but you also have this cool water monster, even though it has a very visible zipper on the back of the mask and suit. Turns out that the vampires outside are trying to get the book, which leads to a bunch of low-grade monster shenanigans, and this was released by New World Pictures and produced by Julie Corman, wife of Roger, and hired Howard Cohen to direct, marking his debut. Although he'd go on to do other films for the Cormans, including Space Raiders and Death Stalker 4. Cohen also did a good amount of writing and handled a script for most of the Death Stalker flicks and a bunch of kids' cartoons, including Jace and the Wheeled Warriors. It's funny that this particular era for, was ground zero for a bunch of horror spoofs like student bodies and such, making fun of all the slasher flicks that were being pumped out. So it, it's a little funny that you'd think that this was another of those based on the title, but instead it's more a play on classic horror tropes and characters. Meanwhile, what a missed opportunity with this one since it was released on the same day as Halloween 2, which is probably not the brightest ideas considering it crushed it at the box office, although Saturday would go on to do decent business and have a strong life on cable and VHS. But the funny thing is that they missed their chance because it's clear they were looking to capitalize on the Halloween holiday, but there was a Friday the 13th and Saturday the 14th a mere two weeks later in November and had less competition and a more thematic release date, although it did get a sequel several years later that went straight to video, also directed by Cohen. And my rating on this one is going to be three and a half tapes. I have a fair amount of nostalgia here. And there's some real wild monster fun going on, although the comedy just doesn't really hold up and falls flat a little more than you would expect. Its horror cultural significance is a three, since I think it had a pretty solid relevance at one point, but it's lost a lot of its notoriety without Cable constantly pushing it. But it gets a bit of oomph from being an earlier horror spoof and an HBO staple. Should you watch it? Sure, the, the cheesy monster suits alone are worth the price of admission. Here's one with a sketchy release date since it's reported as being released on October 1st, but also the 23rd, but seems like it just got released sometime in October, and it's Galaxy of Terror. It begins with an old woman and the planet master in the middle of a game, and he sends a ship on a rescue mission. It's The Quest, and it's run by Sarah Palmer, and it's got a crew that consists of Freddy Krueger, Joni, Captain Spaulding, Mr. Hand, and this guy, Zalman King, 
who was an actor but later became a director, who was known for making sexier content like Nine and a Half Weeks and The Red Shoe Diaries. The crew land on the planet Morganthus in search of survivors of a crashed ship, and Aluma has psychic powers, and they start to patrol the ship. Pretty quickly, though, Kaz here is attacked by an alien creature, and they discover this large pyramid structure that they head off to investigate. There they encounter some very familiar looking architecture and are each attacked by different aspects of either things that they said or their fears. And this was a Roger Corman feature for his New World Pictures, even though it was directed by Bruce Clark, although it would end up being his final film. But there's a lot to digest here. First up, the concept of a group of space troopers investigating a distress signal only to discover an alien ship where they meet some unexpected company sure as hell sounds like the plot to Alien, and it's obviously knocking that plot off to some degree. But you could also say that this movie in particular had a lot of influence on that film's sequel, Aliens. The look and aesthetic of this film seems to have directly been moved into that one. And that's actually fairly accurate, since the production designer on this movie was a young James Cameron. He had previously worked with Corman on Battle Beyond the Stars, and this was a step up in terms of responsibility for him, as he also did some second unit directing here. Looking at the sets here, it's clear that he basically used this as a testing ground for what he would later make the whole atmosphere of Aliens, just done with a lot more money. And oddly enough, he's not the only Aliens alum to be behind the scenes here, since Bill Paxton, who played Hicks in Aliens... Hudson, sir. He's Hicks. Oh, sorry. Hudson was also on set just as a set decorator. But there's one big thing people talk about when it comes to this movie, and it's the worm scene. You see, since whatever's happening seems to prey on the character's individual fears, th there's a character named Damia who has a fear of worms and meets her demise by being attacked by a giant one. The actress, Taffy O'Connell, had agreed to do a nude scene, and in the script, she was meant to be attacked by the beast and it would remove her cock, and she'd be eaten. However, it turned out that Corman had promised one of the investors that the film would contain a sex scene, and that basically left it down to either O'Connell or Aaron Moran. But since she negotiated out of a nude scene in favor of a more graphic death scene, they went with O'Connell. But since her character didn't have a love interest, they went with having the sex scene be her death scene. And instead of the giant worm just eating her, it would first molest her. Well, when Corman told this to them, both O'Donnell and Clark refused. So Roger decided to go ahead and direct the scene himself, using a body double for any of the instances that O'Connell wasn't comfortable with. Now, this isn't confirmed, but they insinuate it pretty heavily on the DVD commentary. But one of the crew members was a woman named Aya Labunka who was doing some of the creature effects. It's very strongly suggested that it was actually her that stepped in for those moments, and it's her body on screen in the moments that it's not O'Connell. Later, LaBunka would go on to greater success as a producer and would later marry Wes Craven, remaining his wife until his passing. The worm scene was enough to get the film an X rating, causing some minor trims to be made to it and entered it into notoriety forever but was also almost deadly as well, since the worm prop was quite heavy and at one point almost fell on top of the actress, which likely would have killed her. It's hard to say how much the budget was, with some sites saying 700 k and others saying around $2 million, but it pulled in around $4 million in ticket sales and go on to be fairly notorious in the horror world. And my rating on it is a 3.5. This is a weirdly slick, but also sleazy, little flick with some surprising death and odd turns. It's a bit slow in the middle where it's just walking around hallways, but it's a good watch. Its significance is the same, although it's never gone beyond cult status. It's well known for its controversy, containing a ton of horrors familiar faces, and serving as the starting point for Cameron's career. Should you watch it? Sure, just be aware that the worm scene is pretty over-the-top stuff. Here's another one with a questionable release date, although it's tagged as coming out in October in Italy, and it's absurd. 
That's the title of the film, not just a statement about its contents. And it didn't get released in the US until 1986. This starts with a man being chased by a priest and a young girl with a spinal injury in bed, and the man being chased suffers from a big stomach wound and has to be operated on. And of course, that's George Eastman, who we've seen a few times in the project now. He keeps waking up during the procedure. It's absurd. Yes, I know. It's the title of the movie. I, I already did that joke. The man was injured trying to get into Katya's house, and her mother talks to the police, but soon enough, our guy is awake and starts killing in order to escape. Turns out the guy's name is Mikos, and he was part of an experiment in the Vatican. He's now immortal and can revive from injury and, and heal up. And like most of the other films that I've had Eastman in that, that I've featured, this is directed by Joe Diamato, marking his fifth appearance on the project so far. He had previously done Orgasmonero, Porno Holocaust, the Erotic Knights of the Living Dead, and Anthropophagus, and this movie originally began as a sequel to that one. It's actually referred to as Anthropophagus 2, or The Grim Reaper 2, as that was its title in some areas. According to Eastman, it was him who didn't want the movie to be a direct sequel, and instead serve as his own tale, and altered the original treatment to be its own thing, and wanted to make something more along the lines of Halloween. It's possible to take this as a sequel if you like, since Eastman's character was disemboweled in the finale of Anthropophagus, so if you eliminate the intro to this and have it begin with the surgery scene, it can be seen as picking up right where that one left off. Along the way, there's a small role for Michel Suave as a biker who gets a death scene, and that was pretty much his gig at this point, showing up in various flicks and getting killed, before becoming a director himself, and giving us some solid genre flicks. It was another that landed on the UK video nasty list and was one of the ones that was also prosecuted for obscenity, but managed to get some success and notoriety, but frequently for being called a Halloween ripoff, given its plot of an unstoppable killer who has escaped from somewhere that was holding him and a man who worked there chasing him and the final act with killer attacking a babysitter and young child. And I'm giving this one a 3, as it's one of the better Diamato flicks I've watched, but it's still a bit on the dull side. It gets pretty wild at the ending, though, and it's more entertaining than, than not. Its significance is a 2.5, since I think that it's one of the director's more noted films, but it's still a bit lost in time. Should you watch it? Probably. It's got some fun stuff in it, and one hell of a final shot. I'm not drunk! I feel like this block has been pretty mainstream so far, but that's going to change on November 1st in the UK with an obscure little number called The Orchard and Murder. It starts in the most British way possible with a game of cricket, and it's next to an orchard where a couple is really making out. And thank goodness for this close-up. And then Pauline starts to wander off by herself, meeting the station agent at the railway nearby. He's a bit awkward and has a hunched back, and he tells her about the previous tenants who both killed themselves. He has an assistant named Ewan who has a meltdown and kills a bunny. And then when things turn to murder, it's time for a cover up. And this is a relatively short entry. It's less than an hour and was by Kristen Marnham, who, who didn't have a long career. After this, he only shot one short film, one episode of a TV show, and then one final film in 1988. But he wrote this one as well and it was released as a short film in front of Dead and Buried in the UK. It initially ran in a smaller amount of theaters in northeastern England, but then expanded to the rest of the area later on in the month. It was the first film for Clive Mantle, who would go on to a pretty long acting filmography, even if he never really had any breakout roles. I mean, he was the villain in Superman 4 until all of his scenes were cut out of the film, but he's been consistently working since this was released. This one was actually based on a real crime in Kent, but takes liberties with the details to create a sleazy, yet stylish little thriller. It's also notable in that it's another famous face's first film, and that's the imaginary friend, Drop Dead Fred. Rick Mayall himself, and this was his first gig, but not the first release, since both American Werewolf in London and Shock Treatment would beat this film to the screen. Besides, he's barely even visible here as an uncredited policeman. 
and I'm giving this one a three. It's a decent, dirty little watch with some cool stuff going on in it and weird characters. Its significance is just a 1.5 though, since it's virtually completely unknown, and I just gave it the extra 0.5 for kicking off the careers of Mayall and Mantle. Should you watch it? Probably, it's pretty short and entertaining enough. The boys used to tell me that they used to show me pictures. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't get it off my mind. Okay, here's one that's tricky to talk about. On November 10th, we'll look at the controversial release of Faces of Death 2. This is a follow-up to the rather infamous film-slash-documentary Faces of Death from 1978, which totaled Dr. Francis Gross, a doctor obsessed with death, seeking out footage and information about trying to understand the various uh, faces of death. It was such a monster success that, of course, a second one had to be done. Dr. Gross returns and displays even more vignettes of violence from around the world. There are shots of the aftermath of a horrible avalanche and, and one of the more notorious bits of footage. They show the boxing match of Johnny Owen, Mexican fighter who was only 24 years old, and in 1980 fought against Lupe Pintor, who knocked him out. But the KO was so severe that he was rushed to the hospital where he went into a coma. They tried operating, but he died shortly after. So, although you're not actually watching the footage of someone dying live, you are witnessing the injury that led to it. And unlike the first film, which mixed in a rather large amount of faked footage along with real scenes of carnage, this one is primarily actual scenes of death and violence. There's even footage of the real death of Kenny Powers. No, not, not, not that one. This is a real guy who wanted to be like Evil Knievel, but based on the fact that I'm talking about him in Freaking Faces of Death 2, I think you can probably guess that he did not. And just like the first film, this was the work of Conan La Cellier, who was actually an alias for John Allen Schwartz, who directed the entire Faces of Death series, all the way through number six, because yes, there's six of these, and there's more, in fact, with like best of videos and unofficial sequels. It's pr pretty hard to watch, mainly for the war footage, which features too many shots of dead children and some rather unpleasant animal cruelty. Th there's still some fakery going on here since there's an extended scene of a robbery gone wrong that was shot specifically for the film and it's comedically staged, but it also snuck in some footage from the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan which had occurred just a short while before the release, although that segment is missing from some releases. And I'm giving this one a two because I, I don't know, man. I, I just don't dig, dig the real stuff. G g g give me that fake horror, please, please and thank you. There's still some interesting information in here though, so I'll give it a bit extra for that. Its horror cultural significance is a three since it's very well known, but it's not like this particular entry stands out from the others, but this is one that people do recognize. Should you watch it? If this sort of thing appeals to you, I guess, but if you like your movies to be movies, then nah. Still, there is one hope, that our body suffers little pain and that our mind will end on a thought unaffected by the fear of dying. This next entry had its premiere on November 13th in 81, although it didn't get a wider release until February of 82, and it's Evil Speak. It begins with Bull, as a Satanist, being told that he and his people are banished, and then bounces to modern times as the Ice Cream Man is here playing footy, and his coach is a reanimated cop. One of his teammates, and holy crap, you, you can barely recognize him here, but this is Donna's dad. Dwayne Nelson is here too, and they attend a military academy with Uncle Victor and also Uncle Lewis. And one day while cleaning out the basement, Cooper Smith discovers a secret passage that contains occult items and an old book. He takes that book and puts it through a translation program in the computer while Stanley continues to be bullied and put down. After reading the incantation, he's attacked by his classmates wearing the cult's costumes, and soon, there's head twisting, man-eating pigs, and, and this was the directorial debut of Eric Weston, who directed a few other films, none of them horror, but was more involved in the producing ends of things, and is listed as one of the early execs at TriStar Pictures. 
and this one had a ton of controversy after release due to the amount of violence within. It was one of the video nasties in the UK and banned there for quite a while, but not just because of the gore, but also for the satanic elements of the storyline. It didn't get released there until 87 after a series of edits to trim down the gore, but oddly they also deleted some of the text from the computer screens because you know how damaging it can be to see scary Satan words on the TV box. But I guess it has definitely got some evil influence because Church of Satan founder Anton LaVey loved this movie and said that it was one of his favorites. It said that the original version submitted for the ratings was far bloodier with quite a few elongated sections which of course had to be cut down before release, but all versions of that appear to be lost. It wasn't a hit, and budget reports vary, saying anything from 1 million to 4 million, but according to AFI, only brought in around half a million in ticket sales. One thing's for certain though, the finale of this is an all-out gore fest with tons of decapitations and exploding heads. And this one gets three tapes from me. I, I enjoy this one, but it takes way too long to figure out where it's going. But man, is it a trip once it gets there. Its significance is a 2.5 since it's slightly known and does feature some recognizable faces, but really straddles that cult picture line. Should you watch it? Yes. Put it into your computer and translate it. The next one arrived on November 13th on the same day as Evil Speaks premiere, and it's the odd little picture, Strange Behavior, also known as Dead Kids. It starts with a man being killed during a blackout, and then Jonathan from Shocker's dad is here, and his son is Billy the Kid. And John's a cop, and Pete's a student alongside Jimmy Olsen, and in one of his courses, the professor uses footage of her dead mentor to lead the class. And Nurse Ratchet is on hand as well. The kids all go to a Halloween party and someone in a Tor mask shows up and kills one of them and is almost caught by the rest of them and they reveal themselves to be Oliver. The next day the mayor's son is found dead in a cornfield dressed up as a scarecrow while Peep begins to attend Professor Parkinson's experiment and is given a drug that she says will make him smarter and better and that I mentioned that his name is Peter Brady? The murders continue as the mystery deepens, and this was another directorial debut, this time for Michael S. Lachlan, who had been a producer for over a decade at this point. He did a number of films throughout the late 60s and early 70s, but this was his transition to being behind the chair, although he would only do two more movies after this one. The film after this was called Strange Invaders, and he intended to make what was called The Strange Trilogy. Three films with Strange in their title, but not connected in any other way. But the second film bombed, so plans to make a third were scrapped. It's unknown what that film would have been, but Lachlan instead made his third film a Jodie Foster and John Lithgow starring thriller called Mesmerize, and that film apparently put him off directing. He left the industry. It looked like there was a third script written by Lachlan called The Adventures of Philip Strange that took place in World War II, but that's all the information available. It wasn't the only debut here since the writer of this one became a touch more notorious since the script was by a young Bill Condon. He wrote this movie in Strange Invaders but then would then move into directing his own scripts, eventually doing one of the Candyman sequels, but then got nominated for an Oscar for making Gods and Monsters, and eventually won one for Chicago, and is currently one of the higher echelon directors in Hollywood with Dreamgirls and two Breaking Dawn Twilight films and a live action Beauty and the Beast. And this one got some flack for the violence in it since, like some of the others here, it was also tagged as one of the UK nasties, although it was not prosecuted. But the reviews were actually pretty favorable, with critics commending the acting and offbeat sensibilities. And my rating on this one is a 3.5. This one's actually pretty enjoyable. It's a weird, quirky little thriller with some cool stuff going on. I, I really, I really enjoyed it. Its cultural significance is a touch lower though, it's only a 2.5 because I feel like this one is actually very, very under the radar and not very frequently discussed or talked about, but it is the starting point for the career of a major Hollywood presence, so I figured it has to get that 2.5. 
Should you watch it? Yeah, if you don't, I'd consider it strange behavior. Uh, now we're running very late. I wish you'd stop all this. Jesus. This next one is another one that had a debut on November 20th, playing in Oregon, but like Evil Speak, went wider in February of 1982. And it's Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, which also went under the title Night Warning. The intro is pretty spectacular as we get a young couple losing their brakes, getting into a massive crash that kills them both. We then jump to years later as that couple's son, Billy, is now a teenager living with the queen of the sixth dimension. And he goes to school with Stephanie and little baby Hicks. He's Hicks. Sorry, I, I keep, 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 on, keep on doing that. Earlier, I mentioned that Paxton was working behind the scenes on film, but he was also just getting into acting. And this is one of his first gigs. Before this, he had only tiny roles, like, like as an extra in Stripes and the guy in the Fish Heads music videos, which he also directed, by the way. But here, he has an actual role. Aunt Cheryl is a bit controlling, and when a handyman spurns her advances, she kills him. The police arrive, and she says that it was self-defense, and he tried to rape her, which the police handle in the classiest way. You buy attempted rape? No. Do you? No. And a Buford Pusser, but not THE Buford Pusser, is here, along with Gary's dad, who's into plumbing, and he's into plumbing, and I guess he, I guess he plumbs. The detective finds out that the school coach is gay and takes a really classy tactic with it. Chances are you're going to get yourself lynched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, is this 1981 or 2023? Hate that I hate that I had to make that joke. Hate it. Billy is involved with Julie and talk about casting. Jimmy McNichol, who played Billy, was around 19 during the filming of this one and playing a 17-year-old boy, whereas Julia Duffy was 29. 10 years his senior, and also playing a 17-year-old. And this is another one with some wild stuff behind the scenes. The original director was Michael Miller, who had done some action stuff before this, including Jackson County Jail with Tommy Lee Jones. And he came on and did the opening car crash with his cinematographer, Jean de freaking Bont. However, when the producers felt that he was moving far too slowly, they fired him and replaced him with William Asher who was more known for doing light-hearted comedies like Beach Blanket Bingo and a long, long run on Bewitched. The filming was decent, but it said that Susan Tyrell didn't enjoy the shoot and didn't have high hopes for the content and then never watched the finished product, although eventually gave in and did and really liked it. And even though the reviews when it came out were pretty decent, it's taken on a bit of a more positive standpoint as time moves on, as an early positive portrayal of homosexuality. At this point, gay characters were mostly punchlines and caricatures, so having a coach character be a non-stereotypical portrayal, while at the same time showing the homophobe as the clear villain, was rather unique. And I'm giving this one a three and a half. There's some solid character development in this one, and a great descent into madness performance by Tyrell. Its significance is a three, since it's still kind of cult in terms of popularity, but had an early role for Paxton and has increased in appreciation over time. Should you watch it? Yeah, just don't try to figure out how the title is relevant. I'm your mother. <laughs> this block ends on that same day, November 20th, as we head back into slasher territory and go back into the wilderness with Don't Go in the Woods. It kicks off with a man being killed in the woods, and then we meet four friends on a hiking trip, oblivious to more killings happening nearby. Thankfully, the local police are on the job, and yeah, they're, they're a pretty wacky bunch, and some of the nicest dubbing that you're going to get. Stop messing in county business, Jesse. The sheriff will take care of everything outside the city limits. We're city. They set up camp for the night to tell spooky stories. Oh, dick. The killings continue in a random fashion, including a painter with a baby that then goes missing and, and presumed killed? Our killer is this wild man looking savage guy, and the action eventually catches up to our main hikers, causing them to have to survive. And this is from James Bryan, 
and he had a really varied career. And this is this is a weird tie-in, I guess, to other films on this list, but one of the things he did was an X-rated film in the mid-70s called Beach Blanket Bango, which was a parody of Beach Blanket Bingo from William Asher, who made Butcher Baker. And on that film, there was a set dresser using the alias of Pete Latrec, who was actually Bill Paxton, who was the set dresser on Galaxy of Terror and was in Butcher Baker. And I wonder if he told Asher about that. Like, oh yeah, I did set work on a porn parody of one of your movies. The rest of Brian's filmography is mostly adult work, but also some low budget action flicks. But he also did a whole lot of work on much bigger productions in the sound field. It was shot on a super low budget of 150,000 bucks and got torn apart in the reviews with critics calling it cheap and derivative, but somehow it ended up getting a lot of notoriety. Part of that may have been its designation as one of the video nasties, which really seems to be a theme with this block, but this one was banned in the UK and didn't get released there until 2007, and weirdly got a sort of remake in 2010. It's weird because even though it has the title and shares the concept of a killer in the woods, there's no other connections. It's basically a remake in name only and is sort of a musical. And oh yeah, was directed by the kingpin himself, Vincent D'Onofrio. But I'm only giving this one a two. This one is, is not great. It's kind of slow. It has a couple of fun moments with the killer, but overall, it's pretty dull and just people walking around the woods. Its significance is a touch higher though at a three since it is a little bit more known, got a remake out of it, and was another instance of that killer in the woods slasher concept that was going on very big at the moment. Should you watch it? Possibly, I don't know. For me, there's several other films from this same era that did the same thing, but quite a bit better. It's Dick. So there you have it. That's the block of films. Uh, October and November of 1981. We're getting very close to the ending of the year here. And my favorite from this block, this is really tough because there was none in this list that stand out of being like, oh my God, that's my favorite. I love that one. That is the greatest film. There was a lot of films in this list that were really good and very cool, but nothing outstanding. And it came down to Galaxy of Terror and Butcher Baker for me, both of which were a lot of fun and really cool movies to watch. But I think Galaxy of Terror gets the edge for having all those really wild and cool visuals going on and like just a bunch of uniqueness happening that, that made it very interesting. Um, so I guess that's my favorite. Let me know what your favorite is down below in the comments. I want to hear which one you liked the most and which one of these that you haven't seen and now would like to. Tell me that down below. If you liked the video, as always, hit the like button. If you enjoy the channel, as always, hit the subscribe button and hit the bells to get notified when new episodes arrive. And also check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines where you can help support the project and keep it going. But yeah, we are getting very close to the ending of 1981, getting ready to move on to 82, but there's still one more episode of 81 coming very soon on 80s Project.